to introduce our guest speaker today is Kevin Cooper. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And yes, I'm going to give someone credit for making me a part of the club. So I don't know if anyone, if Phil gets the stipend uh, for me joining the club or not, but um, when I hear that I've been here several times, it's time for me to become a member. So I'm looking forward to becoming a uh, part of this organization. My name is Kevin Cooper. I work for Phil Labity at Labity Communications. And our guest speaker today is John Bradford. Uh, John has an inspiring story to tell. You know, when you, when you hear people say, you gotta meet this guy, or wait till you meet this guy, you're like, okay, this guy better be pretty good. Well, I had the pleasure of meeting John Tuesday, and he is everything that he was built up by Phil and Michaela, who also works with us at Lavity Communications. And he's an inspiring guy. Uh, he has an inspiring story to tell, not just for us business people, but for all people. And quite honestly, I hope that once um, uh, the video is put on the link, that a lot of young people will watch this presentation today because John's story is his own story, but it's a story that could really be pertained to all of us as we really don't know what God has in store for us, especially as a young person. I've heard that people say that between the age of 20 and 30, our lives change more than any other time in our life. And, and if you could probably go back in your youth and say, oh, I know exactly what I was going to do then, and my life turned out to be exactly the same way that I thought it was going to be now. I think we'd all be greatly uh, mistaken. So that is the story you're going to hear. It's an inspiring story. And um, John's resume shows us that he is the former vice president of operations for a general contracting construction company in central Ohio, later owning his own construction company. He was educated at Ohio University, and I was unprepared. Thank you. You can come out, bring it up. Okay. Thank you. I, I asked her to print it out instead of using it on my iPhone because I thought Tom was going to do this. So thank you very story? much. Um, he owned his own construction company in Central Ohio, and he was educated at Ohio University with degrees in science and physics, later to acquire a master's in business administration. You'll hear his story of how he made a life-changing decision to form a new company dedicated to building faith, to coach, mentor, inspire, and motivate, and to do much of his work in the wilderness. That's why he has a company that's called Wilderness Outreach. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you from Columbus, Ohio, Mr. John Bradford. The people that I was sitting with at, at uh, lunch there might think this is going to be like a slideshow of the Holy Land. It's not. So, yeah, this is not a slideshow about the wilderness or all the treks I've been on through, the, through the, my years. But it is a story about really about how God's everything that happens in our life from the beginning to the end, especially I'm going to say as business people, as leaders in the community, how God is working through us from the, at every moment. So even through our our troubles, our, you know, the, the things that we fall down on and we get back up, our, our victories and our defeats, God's working in our life the whole time and certainly was working with me. And so really what I want you to do, if, as you come to the end of this, you know, if you're not thinking, what's God calling me to? I'm really saying your greater call is really to the new evangelization and working on some, in some apostolate level of really building the kingdom of God of really doing the work of Jesus Christ in the here and the now in the world today. Because we as Catholics, as Roman Catholics, were called to be not of the world, but in the world and basically transforming it. And uh, so that's, that's what I want you to think about and, and really think about, you know, there you are, there's, there's our, our three ideas right there from the Omaha Catholic Business Club, faith, ethics, and business. And how do we get into that sweet spot, right? That's really where we want to be, right in that sweet spot. So every, all of those are informing our actions and our business at all times. So this is really a critical path of my calling. And for some of you, are there maybe contractors or engineers or architects, you understand what the critical path is. And it's really that journey, like if you think about it, a critical path for building a house, you gotta start with the foundation, you gotta go to the basement, you gotta go to the framing, and you finish with the roofing and the drywall. So there's a critical path in all of our lives that takes us somewhere and that 
What you'll see is that my critical path started as a Protestant in my 20s that Kevin was talking about. I thought I was a pagan, or I, I behaved like one, and then I was drawn by God into the Roman Catholic Church. And there were lots of things that happened during that time period that really trials and tribulations, good things, bad things, but God at the same time, all this time he's forming me, right, as this man to do his work at a later point in time. So as a young man, I had a father who was a victim of alcoholism, but he got sober, right? So in a, in a, in a, in a, as a very young man, I saw this man become, go from a drunk to a stand-up dad who was a great mentor and taught me a lot of things. So he became, and then I felt the love as a, as a young man. And then, then I learned from him, so I played, I, I hunted, I played football, I ran in the fields in the woods with my dogs and, and really enjoyed the great outdoors. And my father was a surveyor and a contractor. So I started to be mentored by my father in ways that I really came with me and stayed with me a lifetime. So anyway, when I got to college though, it was like Opie from uh, Mayberry goes to the big city, right? And I frankly, I didn't know what was, uh, what was in store for me because when I got there, you know, I was gonna study First, the engineering, then I changed it over to physics and mathematics and ended up with a degree in physics, but I ran into this secular culture thing. And I was just out of Boys Town and I saw this quote out there that I was talking to, is it Stephen? About that there are no bad boys, there's only bad environment. I'm gonna tell you right now that it's a caustic environment and it's probably a hundred times worse today than it was when I went there in 1970. So anyway, I was confronted with a secular culture and it really, at the end of four years of physics, I had all my friends that were saying, okay, I'm going to high state and get a master's degree, or I'm gonna to go to work in nuclear engineering. Well, I had worked myself through college in the construction industry in a, in a company. And I was a full-fledged carpenter. I knew I had the tools, I had the trades, but something was stuck in my crawl. Something was calling me something different. So I could have gone to graduate school and really probably even taught in university or whatever, but there was something that was like, egging me on and I said, they said, what are you doing, John? I said, I'm loading up all my tools and I'm heading out. So I spent the next six years basically, somewhat like this young man's like, N nowhere in particular. Well, I, I had a, I, there was something in particular, I just didn't know what it was. So I headed out and I really went, I discovered this recently that I was on the hero's journey. And if you're aware of Joseph Campbell, he was actually a fallen away Catholic that on his deathbed finally came back to Roman Catholicism. But uh, so he talks about this journey that you see in all the classical lit literature, right? So, so you're called from the knowns, we're in this comfortable known world and there's something that's stuck in there that's pushing us into the unknown and that was it. So I, I left college, I graduated and I just headed out onto the road and I spent the next five to six years in the Western United States, working my skills as a carpenter, an entrepreneur, and then I would backpack. So I'd go up into the mountains, I'd make enough money, I'd just head up into the Sierra Nevada and backpack for two weeks. I'd go up into Oregon, you know, I'd go into, into Colorado, up into Idaho, and I did all this backpacking and really, this kind of, I was my, something in my heart was searching for something, so I tried to find it in the wilderness. After Several years of that, though, I, I was in this pagan lifestyle again, so I wasn't, even though I grew up Protestant, I believed in God, but something was missing, right? And I was getting involved in things that I shouldn't have been. I did a lot of bad things that were like, I felt like God was picking me up and throwing me down, right? You've seen that, that Psalm verse, right? God's picking me up and he's throwing me down. So I came to the end of this time and I really went down into that abyss, right? That abyss, and I finally came back up and I said, dear God, help me. So as a prodigal son, returning, I said, I gotta get away from this life of non-integrity, of not telling the truth, of not doing what's right, of not living a faithful life. So I finally, I came back, I said, I just gotta get my head down and get to work, right? So I really was, what was happening inside my heart, I was a faith was starting to come alive. God was fishing for me, he was pulling me in. And I knew it had something to do with integrity and lifestyle. I had to find the right lifestyle. I had to live a life of faith. And I had to be, become this man of integrity that I really felt called to be. I had to get away from that pagan lifestyle. And on a deeper level then, I, there was a calling. I, just, I kept hearing this calling about self-mastery. Is there something in there that's like, you gotta get better. You gotta constantly be on this path of personal improvement and trying to figure out what's going on in God's universe and what he wants you to do. 
So I wanted to know who I am, what's my purpose, what am I good at while well, I work my way through college in construction. And where can I apply my talents? Well, I went right back into construction, but I really, I, what I did instead of being an entrepreneur, I just went to work with some large construction companies, and one in particular in central Ohio, where I really wanted to, I wanted to become the go-to guy in a way, right? I wanted to become this man of integrity that people could rely on. And I also found at that point in time, a woman who was divorced with child, my heart just leaped out. I was like, there I am, I'm needed as a man. There I'm needed as a provider and protector. So I really was the go-to guy. You might say as a person that relies on in difficult situations, right? So I end up finding a construction company where I was the go-to guy. And I end up finding a wife and a child that I was a go-to guy for. But sometimes you're the hero and sometimes you're the hatchet man. And frankly, in that business, I was both. And I was, I was good at that, you know? So I'm, I'm kind of a fighter at heart. So like if somebody, you get a fight with somebody, it's like, I'm here, boss. If you got to, whenever the heavy lifting would take place. So within his company, I ended up becoming the guy that basically ran all the operations, hired everybody, and fired everybody. So I was like, so, and not always driven by, say, that ethics and that integrity that was, once again, in, in, inside of me saying, John, integrity, you know, morality. So there was this constant calling. It was almost like God was whispering and he's saying, self-mastery leadership and there was something when I heard those two words it was almost like an adventure into the wilderness again for me there was something when I heard when I thought about those words self-mastery and leadership it was almost like this calling it was like God was calling from way out there and I was just feeling this this intense wow there's something to that right so I knew that some that that me, me as a human being in order to I, the sweet spot I wanted to get into is where the spiritual and the intellectual and the physical come together right I wanted to honor my physical body. I wanted to be constantly working intellectually to understand the way God's universe is put together and how I'm supposed to be in it and then, and then have these spiritual values that were guiding me all the way along. Once again, getting into that sweet spot. In this process, I really started, when I started thinking about leadership, I really got interested in how people work, right? So I was hiring and, and, and working with people, and I was kind of, what motivates people? You know, what causes them to want to do something or be good at something? And how, you know, how can you look at a human being and say they're right for this position or they're right for that position or they're, you know, we can use that guy for this or that guy's wrong? So I really got into like, and I know this company's from around here, but the Gallup Strength Survey and then the Myers-Briggs test. But what I really found, and I'm, I'm gonna push this right now, is the, the Everything Disc program. I think it's one of the most concise, easy to do, human resource leadership, self-knowledge tools that there is in, in all of the human resource industries right now. And really got into that to try to, and it really helped me to understand myself and understand other people. At the same time, I was starting to get involved with the self-help gurus, you might say, right? The business gurus, and some of you folks might be as old as me and remember Earl Nightingale and his great saying, right? What did he say? We become what we think about. Isn't that amazing? I mean, think about that. And, and then Brian Tracy, following in behind that, says, you need to be thinking about what you're thinking about. Now, isn't that complex? You mean I'm supposed to be thinking about what I'm thinking about, right? And he actually, in a sense, in his coaching, he kind of said, yeah, when you're driving down the road, take five minutes and look back and say, what have I been thinking about in the past five minutes? And when I actually started doing that, it got, got kind of scary because you realize there's a lot of garbage up there floating around, right? And this kind of this, this wheel, I call it the, the wheel of nonsense that can float around in our head. So, so these guys, along with Dennis Waitley and Tony Robbins, are saying, you need to clarify that, purify it, get your mind right, thinking about the right things, right? Now that was all good stuff, but there was something missing, right? These guys were really helping me get along, but, they, but how they would kind of measure that you were doing that right was why I got a lot of money. The business is doing really well, so you know I'm doing that right, right? Well, something in there was like, there's something more. So anyway, when I was 12 years old, my dad gave me this book to read. As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, and he was a Protestant minister, wrote that book in 1905 at the same time Albert Einstein was writing his special theory of relativity. He was talking about that concept, but he was anchoring it in the gospel. 
He was anchoring, anchoring it in our Judeo-Christian belief system. And then I, I ran into Tom Peters, who wrote the book, In Search of Excellence, and all of a sudden, he, in his book, which really inspired me, he's talking about there's something about doing the job right that surpasses everything else, right? It's just doing the job right, doing it with excellence. And he also talked about that a lot of the guys that he'd seen in his business consulting, the guys that were really the best were the guys that kind of freaked out at the end of college and took off and ran away for a while. And I, all of a sudden, I said, wow, that might be me. And then, of course, Stephen Covey, who I really love, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, especially because at the, at, the, at the foundation of what Covey was doing, he was talking about two different things. He was talking about the personality ethic versus the character ethic, right? So the personality ethic, and Phil and I got talking about this today, but it's kind of like, I'm going to dress myself up to really look good and kind of say all the right things and do all the right things to impress you so you like me, so you kind of do what I want you to do and give me your money, right? That's kind of the personality ethic. But Covey is saying, no, the foundation of everything is honesty and integrity. It's this character ethic. You do the right thing because the right thing is what you do, right? And then with uh, it's Peter Singy, who is from MIT, he wrote a book called The Fifth Discipline. He's a little less well known, but same thing. I mean, he had this concept, two great concepts in his book, The Fifth Discipline, which is you need to push yourself and your life to absolute honesty. And he's saying, you know your customers out there? Can you be absolutely honest with them? He's saying that's where you need to be. He's also talking about this whole idea of systems thinking and complex cause and effect relationship which I think the Roman Catholic Church has really got the handle on. But it set a really high bar, bar for me. In fact, while Kevin was uh, uh, introducing me, I said, Kevin, what are you doing to me, brother? <laughs> Sorry. So, that's all right. <laughs> so anyway, but there was a high bar because here I was working for this construction company, and all of a sudden I found myself, and I'm having all these ideals and these values, and I'm starting to believe them and run with them, and it's like the environment of the construction company I was working in wasn't quite where I was heading. And so I ask you right now, when you think about your business, is your business a poker game or is it a calling? And the guy I worked with for all those years, this, in fact, I took, picked this picture off of the internet here just a couple days ago, and, and after I stuck it on there and looked at it, I thought, wow, that guy looks remarkably like the guy that, that owned the construction company I worked for. But he was, I learned so much from him, I don't want to disparage him, but to say that I learned, I, everything I learned about construction I, I, from him, I really could bring forward into what I'm doing today, but his business was a poker, was a poker game. And he was actually, and when at the time that I left him, he was actually trying to sell his company to a group of us guys who are leaders in his company. At the same time, he's out here marketing it to somebody else. And of course, when I found out about that, I said, end of the line. And so about that time, I'm getting an MBA. I'm going through a divorce. All of a sudden, I'm going, here's this, I went to this, this I found this woman and this child who I, my heart went out to, and all of a sudden, the next thing I know, I am actually find out that I'm married to a woman who's an atheist. God's pulling me towards him, and here's this woman's an atheist, and the more I start saying, I gotta get right with God here, the more she's saying, you're weird. Get away from me. The last three years of a 14-year marriage I spent in living in separate rooms. And I, and, I, and I was like, what do I do? I was trying to work on this marriage. I was trying to take it and say, honey, come on, let's, let's make this work. What can we do? And it was just, the more I do that, the more I'd be shunned away. And I finally like, got on my knees to God and said, I may burn in hell for this, but I gotta go. I don't know what else to do. And so when I did that, this, these, the next, and then I'm getting an MBA at the time, and all of a sudden, so I'm working with, and an M, if any of you have gotten an MBA, it's a great program. My MBA actually brought me closer to God. It brought me closer to that holistic understanding of who we're supposed to be. And I'm working in, a, in our team MBA with a woman by the name of Rana, who's a Roman Catholic woman, and she kind of helped me through my times and trials in this marriage. And she said, well, so when I got through that, she said, well, if you ever want to marry, or if you ever, not marry, but if you ever want to date again, I have a girlfriend. And I just, I was like, I was like, women, you know. <laughs> and she said, I said, what's her name? And she said, Laura. And all of a sudden, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, and it could be pronounced L-O-R-A or, or whatever, but 
that name had resonated through my young childhood with other very kind, nurturing women. And it was like, wow. So I end up, I end up meeting Laura, who was Roman Catholic from birth. And she had actually gone through a, a divorce and annulment with a husband of hers. And so, so I got to know her. We immediately hit it off. She had a microbiology degree and an MBA. And she worked at a big thing I call Think Tank, Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, and worked with them for many years. And, and we immediately like, Phew. so we're talking about all this, how to, you know, how to do business, how, to, how, to, how do we push ourselves to do business so that we're doing it ethically with our faith and, and, and letting God lead us, right? So next thing you know, I'm thinking, I think I want to marry this woman, right? Well, she informs me I'm not getting married except if it's a mass in the church. And by the way, I'd like you to become Catholic, more or less. Now, by that time, though, I had been going to mass, right? I've been going to mass with her. I'm like, wow. I'm meeting these young men there that are like embracing me. They're businessmen. I'm, it's like, it's starting to roll with me. I got to start talking to the priest. I understand the sacraments. I, I, I really, I'm starting to really believe this whole idea of the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, right? It's really like, yeah, that's it. I knew in my heart it was something that was just there. So anyway, I come into the church because of my beloved wife, Laura. And then with, and at the same time though, there's a character out there named John Paul II. I mean, with a degree in physics and a heavy dose of mathematics, and this guy's talking about faith and reason. If, you, if, you, if you've never read Faith and Reason, man, go for it. You've got to read that. And it's like, this guy's, so he's like got the big, you know, he's got the rod and reel. He's pulling me right in with that. And I mean, I, when I saw that picture, it's like John Paul saying, John, son, come on in. You know, it's like, it's come on over here. So anyway, in this whole thing, left the company, got a divorce, come to Catholicism, great woman, great marriage, Laura and I form our own construction company. Now, I did say, I don't know if there's any of the architects and construction people here, but this is, the, this is a typical construction project. Anybody relate to that? And I worked in what, what's called the building public works trade and company, and, and it's like in, in, that, in that trade, in that business, relationship is about a contract and a set of specifications, period. We can go out and play golf together, but that's not getting you anything, right? So there's a lot of fist fights going on. So you got architects, owners, contractors, and here's what's dictating what you're going to get. And so if an owner comes and says, yes, but I want this, you can say change order. So a big fist fight takes place, right? So anyway, and I love that because I was built for it. You know, remember me, Superman or Hatchet Man, right? So I was just built for that kind of fight and that, that rough and tumble, and I love the construction industry. Not so much with Laura. So after 14 years, or 10 years actually, she starts saying, John, uh, what are you going to do when you're 60 years old anyway? And I say, work. I'm for, and she's, work? Yeah, construction. Yeah, I love it. I love the men. I love the, you know, I love the, the rumble tumble. I love the business. I'm just, I'm made for this. Okay. Another year go by. John, what are you going to do when you're 60? After about three years, she said that again. And I finally said, well, honey, why? Why are you asking me that question? She said, well, I think you're called to something greater, something that God wants you to do. And as soon as she said that, it's like whew, the angst or the, that kind of like I'm arguing with my wife here just disappeared. And I said, she's right. What was odd is back in my head, I was starting to think, man, I'd really like to go backpacking again. And I kept shoving it down because I said, no, that's, that's the way of the pagan. Don't go back to that backpacking into the wilderness and all that the adventure. Don't go there, right? So I was shoving it down. So when she said that, I kind of looked at her and I said, well, honey, I've been thinking about going backpacking. I thought for sure she'd say, what does that have to do with God? But she didn't. She said, well, why don't you do that? So next thing you know, I end up with wilderness outreach. And this one priest right here in the center, uh, Father Matt Hoover, he was with me on this journey of going from construction to wilderness outreach. And, and I was telling the folks at the table, you know, when I left that industry, I didn't miss a heartbeat. I was like, I went right into to doing the work of the church of helping to form men because God had prepared me all along the way. And it's like, I've never missed that. As much as I love construction, I never missed it. 
to this day, I was like, yes, I'm glad I just moved on, right? And fa so Father Hoover said, what you're about, what, what this wilderness outreach is about, is not, you're not building buildings anymore, you're building men. So he was really right on about that. So wilderness outreach today, to, uh, as of today, we've done like 35 major backcountry expeditions. Uh, we always take a priest with us. We go deep into the backcountry. We build an, uh, a sanctuary, an altar. We celebrate mass every day. We go through the whole day reading the liturgy, the hours, and we build and clear hiking trails be with hand tools. So it's really the masculine part of that is that the key to that in masculine spirituality is men are built to work, and that's the way we build brotherhood and relationship together. Work and struggle is fundamental. It's key for men to build relationship together. It's, it cleanses us. It brings us together. So coming back to, to you folks here, I want to suggest some things. For instance, like in my life and my faith, I really think these things really came out. So like in our faith, I think we really have to we think about orthodoxy. What is our faith as Roman Catholic people, right? And it's really that word orthodoxy. And it's the creed. Think of the creed, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Jesus Christ is only Son of our Lord, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, died, and was buried, rose from the dead on the third day, and ascended into heaven. And the seed with God and the Father, and he's going to come back, and he's going to judge the living and the dead. And he sent the Holy Spirit to us because we've got the Pentecost coming right up here, right? And he sent the Holy Spirit into each and every one of us and he's sending it constantly to do his work, to build his kingdom in every, every man and woman that's sitting here. I would also say that prayer was such an important part in my life finally. So in that, in that struggle, in that construction, in that business, something would happen where, I mean, we, we had everything that was sort of hawked to the, to the government to do the, the jobs we were doing. So if something went wrong, we could lose everything. And there would be big problems. I remember every day I would write out a list of problems and then pray to God the Almighty and say, according to your will, God, not mine. Just f figure this out for me. And it, and, it, and it moved in the right direction. So business is really a proving ground for us. It's a battleground. And it's the place where we can really bring our faith to bear, right? To evangelize. So some guiding principles. There's natural and physical law. There is original sin. There is evil. There is the, the answer to all that is Roman Catholic orthodoxy. There is love, which really love is the effort that we make in our lives to help get other people to heaven, right? To help everybody that we see that we're around to really devote our life to them. That everything in our life is God's providence and that our leadership really means being extreme owners of everything that happens in our business. And really with the idea that leaders eat last. Some of the things you might think about doing is doing a SWOT analysis straight from MBA school. What are your strengths and your weaknesses, your opportunities and your threats in your life? And start to think in terms of your apostolate and what you're called to in this manner. And then some of these problems and opportunities that are out there, we're all called to build authentic Catholic culture. There's problems in our educational system, right? The secular culture is infiltrating everywhere. We've got to get out there and stop it. We've got to start... We started to come back. We got a counterattack with orthodoxy, right? We got to start creating our own industry. We have to confront the lies of the culture, specifically, specifically things like gender theory, atheism, and historical revisionism. And I kind of leave you with this do not be afraid, do not be satisfied with mediocrity, but put out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. Because you, every, each and every one of you is called to the greater work that's beyond what you're doing right now, but you're being, being prepared at this moment to do. But I'd like to end with a small prayer, if, it, if you may. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, please send your Holy Spirit into our hearts and reveal to us the work that you want us to do for you in building your kingdom. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Questions? Where's your next uh, travel going to take you to?
Pardon? Where are you going to take your next uh, retreat or group? Yeah, when in a week from tomorrow, I'll be taking our first fathers and sons ages 14 through 17 into the Sierra Nevada mountains with a group of homeschoolers out of Kansas. And then in, in uh, June, we'll be, I'll be with the, uh, the Diocese of Lafayette in Indiana with a rotations director and a whole crew of seminarians that would go on these, once again, these formational retreats into the Sierra Nevada. We're doing two more fathers and sons retreats. So any of you men out there are thinking, I got a son 14 to 17, you really want to go on a great adventure to really bond with your son in a unique way that you've not experienced. We have two of those one in July and one in August, and then a layman's retreat at the end of August. So yeah, we're going to be, have a busy summer. Yeah. And the other thing I would suggest uh, with, uh, uh, along those lines is, is look at wildernessoutreach.net and kind of look at our, and see what we do, and, and kind of see if there's so something in your heart that might call you to do what we're going to do. Yes, Kevin. John, obviously it's a program that brings men together. How does it affect the women in their yeah. lives? Do you have any testimonials or, yeah. or story, just a quick story yeah. to tell how women feel about yeah. the program? Yeah, great question and, and, and just kind of a small uh, story about that. There's a, a man by the name of James, Jim Hahn, who's actually the brother of a priest and he's got like eight kids and his wife, Nicole, and she's a homeschooling, stay-at-home mom and he's like kind of afraid to leave because she's got all the burden when she goes and basically about every two years she tells him you need to go on a wilderness outreach I'm getting a little fed up with you but I mean because basically when we're there we're talking about us men becoming we're on this journey to holiness right and we're in a world today where men don't deserve the love and respect of the women. There's too many men. This environment has contaminated all of our men. We're susceptible to the contamination of the environment. We need men, holy men, to raise up our young men and to train them in to be better men so that they're worthy to be the husbands that the good women of our church need. But yeah, so we, there's a lot of women out there. In fact, if you go to St. Gabriel Radio in Columbus, you, you can hear a whole series of interviews that I did with uh, uh, Patty Hartshorn, or Peggy Hartshorn, who's the head of, uh, of, life, of, of uh, Pro-Life International. And we did like a six series of actually what we called the, the feminine genius and, the, and masculine spirituality to really talk about why this is good. But, but yeah, usually uh, every once in a while we'll have maybe a, a, a feminist type gal say, why aren't you doing this for women? And I'll say, well, just ask my wife. I'm not called to do work with women. I mean, you know, she's like, I'm called to do work with men. You know, women don't really want to be with me. My wife would tell you that. But <laughs> she says, no woman in her right mind would want to go out there with you guys. So, but it's really about making men holier and then really educating ourselves spiritually and intellectually about who we're supposed to be and I think all the wives that have, have, have benefited from this would say yeah they, they're constantly wanting their husbands to go back please go back again you know because they come back invigorated and you know thanks for good question I do have some brochures up here wilderness outreach brochures yeah oh I'm sorry Emily multiple people to organize a certain trip, but yeah. are you essentially a one-man show? I am. Okay. I am. Yeah. I'm just in the process of actually building leadership into the future, so I've got a whole bunch of young guys that have been on this, and so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually kind of creating as that entrepreneur, I'm saying, how can I move this organization into the future as a volunteer organization? So I really want, one of our ideas is we want all men to understand the concept of leadership. So one of the things we do, we do the disc profile, and we really look at the greatest, uh, uh, the, the, the leadership science that's in the world today, the entrepreneurial leadership, and we really train men in to start thinking about that. Think right, right, pray right, and how to, how to and so we're really, at this point, we've got a, a, probably a pool of 24 young men that are saying, I think we're ready to take it into the next generation, because yeah, I'm 64 now, I'm starting to wear out, you know, so it's like, yes. Uh, how do you choose, like uh, you said, you kind of build trails yeah. like that? Mm -hmm. How do you find these trails? And I mean, is it on public land and, and, or is it private property? It's, it's been uh, public land. So, so, for instance, the United States Forest Service, which is really under the Department of Agriculture, 
a lot of times people think national parks, which is under the Department of the Interior. We do a little national park work, but fundamentally in the, the national forest, and that's where all the wilderness areas are. There are so many trails out there that aren't being maintained. They're just dying for volunteers to do it. And the thing is, I mean, frankly, I'm, I'm a little prideful when I say that, but get, get a group of Catholic men together with an attitude. Nobody's going to outwork us. I mean, it's just the way it is. I mean, we've done, like uh, Father Hasser and his men four years ago in the Domeland Wilderness, we cleared eight and a half miles of trail with cross-cut saws of 250 trees in five working days, oh. 12 men. And it says, so you get these guys here. These are seminarians, right? And we're just like leapfrogging each other, moving right down this trail, challenging each other. I mean, it's just, it's just like the challenge of brotherhood, the competition, the prayer. This guy's getting up as soon as they can in the morning. We're going to get up there and get that four-foot ponderosa pine out of the way, right, and just moving. So in the Forest Service, for instance, thought when we went there and looked at this area when we first hiked in, there was a four-and-a-half-mile loop around this meadow, and they said there was like 150 trees, 110 maybe trees are laid down choking off this trail. And the guy said, do you think you can get that done this week? And I said, we'll give it our best shot. We had that done in two days. So we just shot right down the trail and kept, so by the time we were done, we are actually hiking from our base camp out almost eight miles to, to cut the last trees and then turn around hiking back. And of course, on the way out, we're praying the rosary and we're praying the rosary on the way back. And it's just a blessed, wonderful time, yeah. So yeah, the Forest Service kind of like, yeah, please come to our forest. Yeah, we're ready for you, yeah. So we're going to do that in Wyoming. In fact, I'm going to, we're doing a trip in Wyoming. You guys can get in your truck and just drive out there, right? We're actually in the um, Platte River Wilderness, up about 8,000 feet. There's a, an area up in there. There's a four-mile loop trail up there has been choked up because of the pine bark beetle. The trees have died and it's fallen. Now they've got this trail that needs cleared. So we're going out there July 8th with a priest from St. Paul, Minneapolis. We've got about eight men now. That one we don't backpack in. We're literally rolling right up to the trailhead. We're going to camp, set up our base camp, build our sanctuary, and we're taking our crosscut saws. We're going to clear that trail July 8th through the 17th. So, yeah, you ready? You're signing up. <laughs> Phil, get get out the get, get the sheet out. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, do, you, do you have any protection against any of the carnivores out there? <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> It, it, that's, a, that's a real typical question, but if you really look at the 10 top reasons why you die in the wilderness, none of them have anything to do with animals. Isn't that amazing? I mean, as soon as you think about going out there, it's like, you know, you're thinking about the revenant, the, you know, the, the maw bear's coming, he's going to kill me and eat me for a cub, right? That, I mean, that's such a rare occasion, occurrence, that actually, if you think about it, what kills you in the, you know, if, if you look, if you say, if you're out in the wilderness, you say, okay, which creature out here is going to kill me faster than any other creature? There you go. Just look in the mirror. There he is, right there. Mr. Stupid, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, I, 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 I'm that guy, right? I mean, I've been there. So it's like, get lost. I mean, yeah. Even the best back, backwoodsmen get, get in that. So, so anyway, like heart attack, drowning, falling, uh, heat stroke, a cold, those are the things that get you. And, you know, so, but we hear about the bear attack, right? Which is usually because somebody's really being stupid. It's like, there's a mama bear with her cub. How about if I get up here and take the picture? You know, it's like, oh yeah. So yeah, but, yeah. any other questions? Kyle, you're ready to go out to, to Wyoming, right? Absolutely. All right, yeah, he's got that geologist thing going on there. I know he'd like to do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.